Daniel 3.18. Well, tonight is our last night of our Fresh Prince series. And uh, who's enjoyed it so far? Uh, we finally got around to doing it, and here we are finishing it. Praise the Lord. Um, but it has centered around 2 Corinthians 5.17. And it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. And basically what it premises around is the fact that when we come to Jesus, we come usually with a, a little preview of a life that we've built. We've done our best over the time that we've had, with the information that we've had, with the culture that we live in. Can I get some house lights or a preach look up? In, yeah, there we go. It's getting disco in here. And, um, we, come, we come with everything that we've brought to God, but sometimes it's not the best way to live our lives, what we've brought to God. And we can even at times just add God to our lives like a renovation to what he's building. Just a room in our lives that we compartmentalize over here. But through this series, we've determined and we've unfolded the fact that God doesn't want to renovate your life. He wants to completely transform your life, right? He wants to start with a fresh build. He doesn't want to be a renovation, a convenient room, right? Because that doesn't actually change who you are. And I don't know about you, but I needed some changing of who I am. <laughs> from the very core. And so God calls us, the author of life, to say, build your life my way. Build it on the foundation that is Christ. And so we've been talking about some ways that we can build our lives the way that God is wanting us to be building them in His culture, in His way. The good news is that some of the things that we knock off our old lives, we can pick right back up and put back on. But we need to be thinking about what it is we add to our lives nowadays, right? Right? And so this whole series has been about adding a few, um, you know, larger concepts that do not fit when it comes to building our new lives. Things that are popular in our culture that just do not work when it comes to building your life on the foundation that is Christ. Everyone enjoy Cam last week? Yeah? Talking about the self. What a big concept that is. But there is a dying to self that happens. No matter what the world tells us, we need to lose our life so that we might find our life. There is a dying to self that needs to happen, right? Tonight, um, we're going to continue to talk about one last area that I think is um, it underpins how we see the world, particularly in this country. If you saw the Instagram today, you would have got a sneak peek. And uh, we're going to get started right now. I believe that there's two types of people in the world. There are people that love group assignments, and there are people that hate group assignments. And people that haven't ever done an assignment, I am sorry that you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Who loves group assignments in this room? Great. I, I, can, I just did my own study just then. That was amazing. Who hates group assignments in this room? All right. Some independent people like to do things their own way. Nice. I've got a, I've got a um, meme that I found that uh, accurately described my university experience. And uh, we used to send this to each other eventually. Um, and I love group assignments. Like, I really loved group assignments. Um, I don't know if you can figure out why I liked group assignments. But if, if you were to define yourself in this picture, you've had a bit of time to read it, where would you put yourself? Who, who does 99% of the work? Who's modest enough to say they do 99% of the work, yeah? So you guys are the ones that despise group assignments. You're like a, a dirty word, right? Who has no idea what's going on the whole time? Yeah. <laughs> Says he's going to help, but it's not. Yeah, hey, good, I appreciate honesty. Disappear at the very beginning, doesn't show up again till the very end, <laughs> praise. I love your honesty, bro. Yeah, I, I have been a few of these, I would say, but um, I think for uni, I would say I probably was mostly Zach Galifianakis. I had some good friends in uni. But the thing with a group, of uh, a group assignment is you, can't, you get carried. Have you heard of the term you get carried? You know, you get carried by the others in the group. Some do more work. Contribution is often unequal. You know, I was around when they said that, when they uh, brought in that 
that criteria where you had to rate your um, group members. Have you seen that? Where you rate your team on how they, on their contribution to the assignment and it affects their grade. I was done after that. Like I was, but it was good before that. Contributions often unequal. You end up with the same grade. <laughs> Judith is fuming. She's, <laughs> if one fails, you all fail. And if one excels, you all excel. Praise the Lord. I can see text messages I get, by the way. I just got one from Matt Horsey. You're the worst kind of person. <clears throat> You're sound man, everybody. <clears throat> Individual assignments. There's nowhere to really hide for me, you know. You've got to take personal responsibility. You're accountable for your actions. And you usually get out what you put in. And in our world today, there are largely two different ways and two different uh, types of culture at play in different places around the world, right? Many countries, probably a majority of countries in our world, tend to operate with what is called a collectivist culture. A collective society. Has anyone heard of this term before? Yeah? Very family-oriented kind of cultures. Usually they have culture. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We often say we have no culture here. It's just, it's a little bit wacky, our culture. And there are some countries that tend to operate with an individualistic, society, uh, an individualistic culture. Has anyone heard of an individualistic culture, right? And um, I've got a few definitions to put up. Collectivism, if we can get that up, JB is defined as a value system that emphasizes teamwork and cohesion amongst individuals and prioritization of the group over the self. So kind of like the group assignment, right, but in society. So you can, at times when you need to be, you can be carried by other people, right? Your contribution can often be unequal, but your result can sometimes be the same. You can often be dragged down by the actions of others or the group that you fit into, but you can also often excel because of the group you're a part of and the people you're associated with. Um, but there's also some really beautiful elements of collective culture, collective societies, right? Um, great support networks, close friends, close family. I remember going on a missions trip to India a couple years ago, which is largely a collectivist culture, right? And one of the things that stood out to me was this seeing two mates walk down the street holding hands, <laughs> like two male guys would just walk down the street holding hands. And I look, I look over at Jordan and I'm just like, is that? And they, they would tell us that this is just normal. That's how you do friendship here. And I just thought, what a, what a cool, like, at first I was freaked out. I was like, that's a, do I have to do that here? Like, Jordan, come here, Jordan. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but they're just, it just, struck me as a beautiful picture of friendship and vulnerability. And uh, it, it spoke so much just seeing that, that image of two people, two mates holding hands. But individualism, we have a, 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 there's a few different definitions of that, but this is the one I've got here, is the idea that each person should think and act independently rather than depending on others. And what individual individualization has done, individualism has done, sorry, is kind of stumbled upon a way of doing society that really has freed people from the groups that define them and allowed them to go as far as their potential could really take them. And it's led to what we would consider many Western societies. So if you're thinking of a Western culture, it's often defined by what? Individualism, right? It's, it's actually allowed people to go far beyond the things that hold them in place, whether it be family or the, the status that they were born into, right? It led to innovation, wealth, new ideas, and the countries that kind of adapted it greatly accelerated, right? Have you seen this? Yeah? We, we are one of these societies here in Australia. And although um, it has some severe side effects we're finding, um, it can often, you know, uh, it, it can often leave people behind who are less fortunate and, you know, make people feel very isolated and lonely. 
But it focuses on the individual. It says that every person is responsible for their behavior, their actions, that we can make whatever goals we have come to pass, that we are all responsible for our success or lack of it. And I think we get crushed under that sometimes, don't we? It's one of those things that cripples us a little bit, that, oh, the only person in the way of me failing in this society is me. And so that can be quite a a tough thing to overcome. Now, like it or not, Australia is a very, very, very individualistic country. That is our culture. Um, We score, let's get that graph up there, JB, 90 out of 100 in terms of individualism. That is in the top three in the world by a long shot. New Zealand, 70-something, right? This is a, uh, it's a, off a website called Hofsted, um, which study this kind of stuff. And so we, are, we score a score of 90 out of 100, one behind um, the USA and one ahead of Great Britain. And I don't know if it's a competition you want to win, but we're second, okay? Um, it's kind of like the Olympics. And uh, so this is the culture we live in, and we, we see this in our culture in many different kind of ways, right? We often don't see mates walking down the street holding hands, right? Some, some, some do. The girls love it, you know. But I don't often, you won't see me walking down the street holding Jordan's hand. If he kind of reached for it, he'd be in trouble, you know. One family, you'll, one family will often take four or five cars to church. Have you seen that? It's like, we'll see you there. It's like, we're all in the same house. Like, we're all going to the same place. But we're so independent, we're so individually minded that we, we all come in separate cars, right? I did it. My house when I was 17 or uh, when my brother got his license and my sister got her license, I don't know how many cars were at the front, six at times. And it's like, why do we need six cars? <laughs> so we can all do our, what, our own thing, right? We make independent decisions on what we want to do and what we want for our futures individually. People are getting married less. People are living alone more. We're a part of a culture that pushes us further, um, pushes us towards further independence and less and less towards interdependence on one another. And we do this because we found it successful as a society. Society has prospered because of this idea, right? It allows people to go and innovate and be the, the best in the world at something. Question. Which one of these is the right way to live? You know, some of the research I did into the science and the studying that people are doing suggests that in Australia, being closer to either extreme increases a person's likelihood of suicide. That there's actually a happy balance in our country in particular, it changes in other countries, of a bit of both, that is good for you. But the closer you get to extremes, it becomes worse for you, right? Which one do you identify with tonight? The chances are in Australia, I'll raise my hand, we identify default to being an individual, right? We are an individual society. We are raised to think about ourselves, that we are sovereign, that we cannot be violated, We are not at risk of being collectively minded here. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah? Stats would say that we are a 90 out of 100 ranked country for individualization. And I see it in our church. I see it in this next generation. I see it in people in this room, including myself. And we are encouraged to forge our own paths, build our own castle, our own kingdom, our own future, our own fortune, And we often see God through this lens. We try to bring God into our lives, into our future. And when you see the world this way, it's actually very hard to see God any other way than a renovation to you, a renovation to your life, an add-on to where you're going. Can you see that today? that when we have a a strong individual mindset, we might even think to ourselves that coming to church on a Sunday and then being by ourselves and hitting the grind all week is 
what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. And I believe that an overly individualistic culture, a mindset like the one that our Australian culture that I love so fosters is not a culture in which we should build our lives as a new creation. I think there's just a moment where we come and we check the culture tonight. We check the moment where we're in this culture, but we're no longer of this culture. Do you know what I mean? We've been given new identity. We spoke about this a couple of weeks ago. So what does that mean? How does that work out for you right here in our country? That's what we're talking about tonight. Because I believe that God's fresh pressure. Nikki was right this morning. It was hard to say. I believe that the fresh prints, the fresh fingerprints, the fresh identity, and the blueprints that God has for your life are not worked out through an extremely individualistic mindset. I don't think they're applicable to an extremely individualistic mindset. But does that mean that God's a collectivist? There's a great quote from C.S. Lewis. We're going to get it up on the screen. How good C.S. Lewis quotes, by the way? I don't know. I wish he was alive. Unless he is. No, I'm joking. I feel a strong desire to tell you, and I expect you to feel a strong desire to tell me, which of these two errors, individualism or collectivism, is the worst? That is the devil getting at us. He always sends errors into the world in pairs, pairs of opposites, and he always encourages us to spend a lot of time thinking about which is worse. Have you seen that a lot lately, by the way? There's only two, and you've got to focus on one or the other. You see why, of course, he relies on your extra dislike of the one error to draw you gradually into the opposite one. But do not let us be fooled. We have to keep our eyes on the goal and go straight through between both errors. We have no other concern than them with either of them. I want to propose to you tonight that God is both individually minded, but also collectively minded. And the title of my message tonight is called Drafted and Grafted. I believe that you have been drafted and grafted tonight. And I'm going to explain what that means right now. Has anyone heard of the term draft, like the draft? Like you might have heard it in the NBA if you're an NBA fan or an AFL fan. I believe they have a draft. Who knows? Um, but it's also like a war term. And it's basically it's an opportunity where teams get to pick someone based on their individuality and bring them into their team. Is anyone, everyone following? Right, there's a pool of people there that they can choose from and they choose one and they bring that individual into their team environment. It's a very individual event. It is based on that one person, right? And there's an element to your relationship with God that is all about you. Are you following? There is an element about your relationship with God that is all about you. And when we have saved, it is very much like being drafted by God. I'm going to give you some scripture tonight. Can I get it? Is that good? Good. Because Jesus shows us the heart of God for individualism. Luke 15, 3 to 10, he tells us a number of parables. He talks about the lost sheep. And I'm not going to read it all, but it, you know the story of the lost sheep. It says, surely if God, if the shepherd loses a sheep, won't he leave the 99, find that sheep and not rest until it is found, right? We know that story. Then it goes on to the lost coin, about one coin that is lost behind the couch probably, right? And he goes and looks for that lost coin. And then it segues into the parable of the prodigal son, where the father is out waiting for the one, right? God cares about the individual. Can you hear me tonight? God cares about you individually, right? It's one of the most beautiful pictures of God's care and love for the individual are in those three stories. God is not looking at us like a, like a blob, like a blanket, right? He sees every single one of us individually. And I think sometimes we can be guilty of thinking to ourselves, well, does God even know that I signed up? 
you know, does God even see me or am I just like, was I, was I just in a big influx that week and he just missed me? Maybe I'll have to do it again so he noticed, right? And I think we can sometimes forget that God sees you and God cares for your journey and he cares for you as an individual, right? Jesus was clear that God values the one. You know, there's another way that we know that God values the one and it's because the Holy Spirit works in you and me long before we even came to Christ. That is one of the Holy Spirit's functions. In John 16, 7 to 11, it says, but very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove to the world Prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. What, am, what this basically is saying is that the Holy Spirit works with you long before you came to him. He is calling people out, leading to them repentance. You are not the person that is to make people feel convicted about their sin. Do you know who is? the Holy Spirit. That's his job. And he works and he works and he calls and he calls and he whispers people until he, they, they come to repentance with the Father and he follows them individually, right? But it doesn't stop there. In Philippians 1.6, it says, he who began a good work in you will carry it on till completion until the day of Jesus Christ. It doesn't stop for you after you give your life to Jesus. You don't enter some flock of sheep and all of a sudden become invisible to God. Can you hear me? Yeah? God cares about the one. The Holy Spirit is working in you. But God's also clear that we have to take responsibility for our own lives. You know, we see the parable of the talents. The parable of the me- the meaners or whatever they're called. You know, some different versions, they say it differently. And I'm not going to read it all for time's sake, but it's in Luke 19, and you can put it up on the screen as I talk about it. But basically, Jesus is telling a parable which means something to people. And the master gives three of his workers different amounts of talents or money, right? One ten, one five, one three, or two changes. And then he comes back and he asks them, what did you do with it? And one says, oh, I invested it, here's an increase. The next one says, I did this with it, and here's an increase. And the last one was scared, he buried it, and didn't do anything with it. You know the story? And God holds that third one accountable for his individual actions, right? He doesn't go, oh, I made a profit. What a big, it's all right. You know, if I look at the three, I've still made bank today. It's all good. No, he, he, he says, good job, good job. And then he looks at the individual and says, where was your contribution? right? So God is not a, God has individual accountability for our lives. It is not going to be a uh, group assignment in the sense that I used to do them, right? We are all held accountable. You're being voted on by your peers. Not really, but in, you know what I mean. And in Romans fourteen twelve, it says, so each one of us, each one of us will have to give an account of our lives to God. Have I given you enough evidence that God cares about the individual in a sense of his, his care for you, his love for you, but also your own work and your own personal responsibility, right? This isn't getting carried by everybody, free ride to heaven kind of business, right? You are accountable for your life. But apart from being drafted, we're also being grafted. Have you heard of the term skin graft in medicine? right? You take a a piece of skin that very soon on its own will die. It will just rot, right? You attach it to the body and all of a sudden it gets access to the blood flow, the nutrients that is attached to the body, that is part of the body, and it begins to come to life and play a purpose that it could never have actually done on its own, right? That's pretty incredible, don't you reckon? Like, who figured that out? That's a good idea. (laughs) And in our lives, when we get individually saved, right, the Holy Spirit's working on you, and you get saved doing your own thing where eventually you would die, we give our lives to Christ and we get connected to a body. 
where we begin to receive life, blood flow, nutrients, and eventually we take a bit of color, right, and heal and begin to function in a way that we never thought we could do on our own. We're not just being drafted. We're being grafted. We're being added to something. This is a picture of what God does with us. And don't just believe me. Let's have a look. 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 12 to 27. <clears throat> just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit as to form one body whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, uh, if, oh yeah, if that makes sense. If the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. Can you see how we're drafted and grafted tonight? We're added to the body. And to be honest, it sounds like a group assignment again. If one part suffers, every part suffers. But this passage makes it so clear that whilst we're still individuals, we are being added to a body the body of Christ, his church, his bride. And I want to take a quick look at what it looked like in the early church in Acts 2.42. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That's a pretty collective culture, wouldn't you think? That's a collective mindset that they were living in. That they would sell their own stuff for someone else who was in need. They wouldn't go ask the government for it. They would, they would take matters into their own hands. They would sell their own possessions to look after each other. Eating together in each other's homes, going to church, enjoying the favor of all the people. You know, my, the two words that stood out to me there were joy and sincerity. Joy and sincerity. It said that they were eating together with glad and sincere hearts. You know what the opposite of joy and sincerity is? Fake and miserable. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a little bit to do with what we deal with in our culture. People that don't feel like they can be themselves. People that don't feel joy people that are putting it on. And there are parts of our society that could do with a little bit of what we see in Acts 2.42. And God knows it. That's why he modeled it. He doesn't want to take away who you are, the call of God on your life, but he wants to bring us back to understand 
that there is power in community, that God has planned this long before that we could do some studies on it, right? And I don't know about you, but I want joy and sincerity. I don't want to do life without joy and sincerity. I don't want to do life fake. I don't want to come here and be fake. I don't want to go to a life group and not be able to open up to you. And I really believe that those two words are a, they're like a, two words over the next season of this ministry, joy and sincerity. Are you catching that tonight? Joy and sincerity. I, I believe that's speaking to your spirit tonight, whether your brain knows it, but joy and sincerity is what we're looking for from each other. And it's found in community. It's found together in the body. It's the lifeblood for our lives. It's the joy that spurs us on to do good works. It's how we're supposed to live, and it's what Jesus died for. It's what he's coming back for, is his church. So while you have incredible individual value to God, his plan was always to graft you to the body. Always to graft you to the body. It's his plan to to grow you, to sanctify you, to reveal his purpose to you. And it's now impossibly entangled with the body of Christ. You know, Jesus goes to look for the one by leaving the 99 sheep. What do you think he did with that sheep when he found it? Brought it back. Attached it back to the herd. Because sheep are a herd animal, right? God didn't come to find you to then live in the wilderness with you. He came and brought you back into community. He grafted you to the body, right? Galatians 2.20, this is Paul speaking, says, I have been crucified with Christ listen to this, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He goes as far as saying, I don't even live anymore. I'm not here. I'm doing my best that Christ might live in me. And you know, one of the best ways I think we can illustrate this tonight is just through like being an athlete being added to a sporting team. I I like sporting illustrations. Sorry. And I don't usually need to drink water, but for some reason I do tonight. See, the individual is drafted to the team based on their individual value seen by the chooser, right? And we know in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever, so God places value through that scripture on our lives, right? But when they're added to the team, they can now do far more than they could ever do alone. Their individual makeup counts for something, but it doesn't count for much on its own, right? On their own, they're a legend with no one to compare themselves to, with no one to pull them up. Have you ever watched something on TV? Usually when the Olympics comes around, you're like, I could do that. <laughs> That's pretty easy. I could do that. We, and then you actually get in the room with someone else and you realize, oh, it's a ma- it's a great dose of perspective, don't you reckon? Getting into team brings perspective. You actually see value in other people that you didn't realize. It's a humbling experience to know that you're not the best because you're the best when you don't see anyone. You're the best when you're the only person in your world. Why would I change? Why would I grow? Why would I bring things to God? Why would I foster a prayer life? Why would I Why would I foster this relationship with God when I don't need to change? Being in a team forces you to communicate. You realize that you're you're the guy on the team that has the short temper maybe. You realize that you're the guy on the team that's maybe, you know, impatient with other people. Maybe you get frustrated that someone else is not as good as you and you let them have it. But being in team lets you know that you have that problem. You know what I mean? And when you realize that, you don't feel bad about yourself. It fosters your relationship with God on an individual level. You take it away and say, Holy Spirit, I I have realized through this team, through this body, through this community, that I have a problem with this. Help me, God. Help me, God, on an individual level. Can you see how it works together tonight, right? You realize you're weaknesses and limitations in team. You find the parts of you that people value in your team. You know, it blows my mind that as Christians, 
we buy this idea that to find yourself, you have to isolate yourself. There's this idea that I have to go away and like be a monk and remove all the influences in my life to discover myself. You're not finding yourself. You find yourself when you're rubbing up your shoulders against someone else. You find out who you really are in community, right? And I want to encourage you, if you're a Christian here, don't buy that. Don't buy that. We buy it too often that we need to go and be a, you know, wandering, I'm not going to say a word that I haven't planned because it's being recorded and I don't want to end up on one of the videos that the boys do. You don't exist in a vacuum in isolation. Can you hear me? That's not who you are. You were created for community. You actually find out who you were because you have a fight with someone. You find out who you were because you figure out you don't like that person. You find out who you are because you realize certain people don't like you, and you find out why. We are created to be in the body. If you want to know who you are and what you've got to work on, don't sit and think about it. Ask someone else. They often know what you've got to work on. I have no idea half the time. I'm like, tell me, hit it, give it to me straight. I, can, I have to do it every once in a few months when I can handle it, you know. But, and I really believe that if we're going to live the life that God has for us, if we're going to build a future based on the Word of God and build a thing that He wants to build in our lives, it's going to be done with others. It will be done with others. It will not be done by just running your own race. It will not be done by just doing things on your agenda. It will not be done by following your own selfish ambitions because we were created for community. Does this mean that God favors collectivism or individualism? I think I've demonstrated tonight that God is a fan of both in their own purposes, in their own times, in their own context. But what we need to remember as Australians is that God is both. We are not at risk of being collectively minded in our country. This is bringing it back down to us. We sit at 90%. We are in a culture that may not be identically aligned with the one God wants us to live. Can we just take a moment to realize that tonight? That your go-to, that your default might not be what God has intended for your life. On the other hand, we need to know that God still cares about the group, that as an individual, you have to take personal responsibility for your life, that we are all responsible for the individual gifts, talents, abilities, time, treasure that God has given us, that we will all have to give an account of our own lives to God, and that there will be times when we rely on the body, but when the body will need to rely on you. Can I get Joel up on the keys? So my question to you tonight is, where do you sit? If you were to think about your life, the chances are, for no fault of our own, that we lean heavily towards one direction, to the self, to our own lives, to our own minds, to our own goals, run your own race, make your own path, self-sufficient, independent. So much so that when I say these words, you're like, yeah, self-sufficient, independent, because that's what our country is. And these are good things in part, but not to the extremes in which sometimes we live them, and science is saying that, and God is saying it. Maybe you're on the other end of the spectrum tonight, and it might be even a cultural thing. And you're realizing that, you know, I do need 
to be accountable for my own life. I do need to be responsible for my own actions. I will have to stand up and make a move at some point. I will need to contribute to community. I will need to be polite. I will need to be respectful, to be generous. I'm not going to just receive what others do and ride the wave. I'm going to actually stand up and make a stand and contribute and be a part of the body. Can you see how the two extremes work? God loves us all, has His body, but you have a race to run to. You have a cross to bear too. But I suspect that most of us are at risk of avoiding community in this room. Now, I believe that we've got a great community here at Centerpoint, particularly a great young adults community. Who loves our community here? It blew my mind that when I came here, you were, it wasn't from me, by the way. This place was welcoming before I got here, and I was greeted by hospitality and warmth that I'd never felt before, welcomed into a young adults community with open arms. And I just want to continue to encourage people towards community tonight. Because the fresh prints in our lives, a foundational block is whether we choose to live it on our own and come to church every Sunday and then run out and then try and do our week on our own and just have this renovation of Jesus here trying to affect our lives or whether we go for it with the plan He's given us and we take off the gloves and we get into community and we rub shoulders with people and we tears flow and we cook food for each other and we get down and we get into the real sincerity of life and we open up to the issues that are really bothering us and people pray for each other and people lift each other up and encourage each other because that is what God's plan is for your life and it's His plan for His church. Could this be a community where people find joy and sincerity? Joy and sincerity. If you could sell joy today, and I'm not talking about happiness, if you could sell joy, the money you would make, it is in great demand. And God's given us the answer. He's given it to us to deal with to people. I believe that um, God's not just interested in furthering your life, sanctifying you as an individual. The Holy Spirit's working on it. But further than that, I believe He's actually sanctifying His church. He actually came to build His church and He is coming back for His church. I actually believe that God moves far greater on a community than He does in an individual. His body is the light of of the world. You know what it's like if you if you meet one great Christian. It's not enough to change the world. You go I've met that one great Christian and I hate that people's stories are like that sometimes. They know one good Christian and all the rest they find hypocritical. But when a body comes together as a community, grafted together, sanctifying together, looking more and more like Christ every single day, the message that that speaks to the world is far greater than any individual could speak. And I believe that's what God wants to do in this house. And whilst this body is made up of many parts, many individuals, know that we're all in this together. That the message that you want to send to your friends depends on the person next to you as much as it does on you. That we send a message to the world. Not just me through the YouTube. This body, this community sends a message to the world. And so I want to encourage you to continue to value community. We have a number of life groups here, um, young adult aged life groups, and we need that number to increase and we need people to continue to value that because and to be vulnerable at those things and to just pray for people 
and look for joy and sincerity and offer it. Because it's, I don't know about you, but I just don't think it's enough to come and surface talk in a foyer once a week and find that that is sincere. Can I be the first to address the elephant in the room? If you don't feel satisfied from a three-minute conversation at the back of church, you shouldn't. That's not sincerity. Whilst the, the hospitality is sincere, that's not going to bring you joy. It's not going to be the level of relationship you need to rub shoulders and to be sanctified and to move forward. I want to encourage you, take a step of faith, get into a life group, be consistent, make a choice, lead a group. We need to double the amount of groups we have easy. It's not that hard. We're going to make it easier. We're working on some things to make that even easier for people. So I want to encourage you. You can do that uh, through the app. Come and see us. Um, the other thing I want to encourage you tonight is if you've never received Jesus into your life before. You know, I, I, I typed in the word grafted or graft into Google. I saw a funny video this week. It said, if it doesn't come up in that little box at the top of Google, I don't want to know about it. Like the one that tells you the exact definition. And it's like, I don't have to click a link. Like put it in that box, Google. And this is what came up in that box. It said, grafting is a technique that joins two plants into one. In general, a wound is created on one of the plants and the other is inserted into that wound so each plant's tissues can grow together. Jesus was wounded on that cross so that you could live your life in Him. In John 15, 5 to 16, it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this so my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay one's life down for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I call you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that, so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, my Father will give to you. I just think that's a beautiful picture where Jesus was wounded so that you might be added to the vine. You might receive everything that he has for you, that you would come to life when you come to the source and the author of life. And he's made a space for you to be grafted tonight. And I wonder tonight if you've received that, that offer from Jesus, that salvation that he's giving to you, that true joy, that your joy might be complete. I wonder if you've accepted the free gift of eternal life, the love that He gave to you as an individual. The Holy Spirit's been working on your heart for years and years, bringing you to this point. And I wonder if everyone could bow their heads and close their eyes for a moment. I want to give you an opportunity tonight to respond to God. I hope you know tonight that you've been drafted God knows you by name. He called you as an individual. But tonight he's offering the opportunity to be grafted, to be attached to his body, to receive everything he has for you. If you want to receive Jesus tonight, maybe it's for the first time, maybe you're recommitting your life to God. Just while everyone's eyes closed and their heads are bowed, just raise your hand so I can see it. Just do that now. And I just want to pray for you. Yeah, I can see that hand. Anybody else before we pray? Well, I just want everybody to pray this after me. 
Father, I come to you tonight and I confess my need of you. I've done my own life. I've done my own things. And tonight I give it to you. Make me your child. Forgive me of my sins. I want to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. It's a great moment. And I would, I would really love to speak to the person who's put their hand up or find a friend that's brought you here tonight and we can work this out with you because it's a great moment for you tonight. And I, it leads me to my, my final thing I just want to quickly talk to you about is that in the week after retreat is baptisms here at Nightlife. And uh, we haven't been able to have one this year. We had one planned. This series is designed to lead towards baptisms. Because baptism was this moment, it was a, you know, we talked about it two weeks ago, where you get caught in between your two lives, your old and the new. And baptism was this moment where you said, I am burying myself under the waters of baptism with Christ, and I am rising a what? A new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. And baptism, for as long as it's existed, has been about making a line in the sand and saying, this is the life I choose. And if you haven't been baptized, I want to encourage you to to get baptized. It's less of a matter of if I feel like it and more of a Jesus has asked us to do it. And so I would encourage you, if you haven't been baptized, please come and see me. You can actually register privately through the app as well. There's a form on there that you can do that very quickly. And we'll give you all the information that you need. If you don't know, it's in here. It happens right in here. Sits here all year waiting for a few baptisms. And we want to fill that tank with people that are ready to put a line in the sand and say, God, I give my life to you. I don't care how I feel right now, but this is the decision I have made and I'm taking a a first step of obedience in baptism for you. And so please come and see me. Um, If the PM doesn't work for you, if you're here out of of the blue tonight, uh, we have an AM service baptism two weeks afterwards. Um, But that's exciting stuff, yeah? So send us a message. You can... You know how to contact us through the Instagram or through the church or Facebook or a friend. If you need to get added to the group chat, do that. Just grab someone and we'll do it. We'll baptize you in a few weeks. Looking forward to it. Well, we're going to receive our...